Oh, basically, we're going to walk you through a hunt on the podcast today. And it's one that Brody and I had last fall. Yeah, I mean, it's just basically going to be a hunt breakdown, try to talk about the things that maybe you didn't have time to include during the hunt or you forgot to talk about. Or anybody that's watching, if you have any questions at all regarding the hunt conditions, um, as you see, Aaron and Brody are carrying the stands in. Like, if you want to know how we carry our stands in, I mean, just really any, any of those extra details about the hunt, if you're curious... Um, just ask, and yeah. we'll, we'll try to break down as, as much of the thought process as we can as we go along as we're well. We're basically going to be watching the hunt with you throughout the podcast. Okay, so we're just going to start. Afternoon hunt, it. obviously. Get some audio going. Me and Brody are coming back in this evening after this big marsh buck that we saw a few days ago. Jake and I tried him the other night, didn't have any luck, but... Uh, we're moving around a little bit on him in here. There's some really good buck bedding in here straight north of me. And this afternoon, we're experiencing the beginning of this big cold front. This morning when we woke up, it was 10, 15 miles an hour out of the southeast, the wind. And by 5 this evening, it's supposed to be 20 miles an hour out of the northwest. So completely flipping. And throughout the day, on these wind switch days, we've noticed in the past that mature bucks like to get up and move from bedding area to bedding area. There's a bunch of big buck tracks in this old dried up slough right here going in and out of these willows. But they should be moving this evening. Okay, so you said there was a wind switch mm -hmm. that day. So how were you guys, had it already switched? It was basically you... a front that was coming through throughout the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. So that morning when we got up it was pretty calm and it was light south wind, low barometer. But anyway, the wind switching around from the south to the north. And we, we have noticed bucks switch their bedding on wind switches mm -hmm. and we were kind of anticipating that we didn't see it in this particular instance on this hunt but these bucks were still in this bedding area right where we had expected them to be and you said you had never been into this area before had you ever scouted this before no just going in blind just from a map yeah that's all we'd done and brody and i had said observation though that's a big key to this hunt what like i mentioned earlier we had spotted that really mm -hmm. big deer in the middle of this marsh about a week before this. And we set an observation stand where we could kind of overlook this general bedding location. We couldn't see down into it like where we're standing right now in the video. But it was uh, a spot that we had observed from a distance. So we had a little bit of knowledge going into it, but not a ton. These and windy so you, days are good to do that on. Yeah, like if you're going in blind to an area like that, right in the middle of bedding, you... You can't ask for a better time to do it than when it's super windy. Right. So you're sneaking in the backside here, and you're you've picked out these willow or not the willow trees, but they're probably cottonwoods. I think they're or, willows. Might have been they're, willows. Okay. Pretty well, sure well, they're anyways, willows. Those are probably some of the biggest trees. That's the, like that. That was the biggest tree. That was the <laughs> biggest tree. You selected that. Sure, that big dead looking thing over there to the right. But yeah, that was the biggest tree in there. And what's interesting is you're about to watch me and Brody hang these stands. We actually heard deer coughing in this bedding area, right to the left of where I'm standing, about 30 yards away. And we ended up we ended up seeing them later in the hunt. There were a couple of does, but we were we were actually hanging this stand within 30, 40 yards of bedded deer. So, at what point did you hear him cough after you had hung the stand already? Oh, while we were while hanging, you're hanging the, the stands, stand. you knew yeah. while wow. we knew there was deer in the bedding right there next to us. Okay, but you can get away with it because of the wind, you know. Maybe even a buck bait that he was using this morning. I'm not sure. Or that a buck was using this morning, showing that bed, Brody. You see the rub in the edge of it. Brian Bush just asked if uh, 20 to 25 now. mile per hour winds are too high. Um, we don't see movement decrease necessarily with those. I mean, in most cases. Most of the okay. time, movement still occurs as it normally would. 20 to 25. Yeah, I think... About the only time I've ever seen it just obviously suppressed is like 30 plus miles an hour. Just sustained, just hard, hard winds. But 2025 is no big deal. In fact, that's, like I said, perfect for going in and doing what you're doing here. Rob's got one more good question here. Yep. Will the bucks stay down there in the marsh, I'm assuming is what you're asking, Rob, if there's no acorns within a half mile? Yes. And there is very few acorns in this general area. They just browse in the marsh. I mean, in the, the closest ag is a long distance away from this as well, but they just want to be in that security cover. I mean, and there's lots and lots of natural browsing here.
Mm-hmm. You can see these deer. I'm pretty sure we film them like munching on stuff mm-hmm. while they're in there. Switch it over. Easterly wind of some sort. Or I'm even sure we can talk wind. some too throughout it. Yeah. It looks like something was laying there just in the last few days. There's fresh tracks right here in the wash leaving the bed. And that's our tree right over there showing, buddy. That little willow right there. That's what we thought was our tree. <laughs> <laughs> As you can tell, it's a pretty small tree that we're hanging in. I just got the camera up and decided to turn around. <laughs> well, it's almost five o'clock and our plans have changed a little bit, as you can tell. Brody and I hung that set over there in that little willow tree. And about the time both of us got up there, the wind started gusting pretty good. It's a small tree to begin with. And uh, I heard the tree crack at the base. So I sent Brody down and I pulled the entire thing down. It just isn't worth it from a safety standpoint. So we pulled everything down and uh, dropped the stands back here in the woods. We're going to go try to set up on the ground somewhere over this slough. There's just no trees around this slough. I mean, we're standing in the only row here that has got any size to them. And be hard we're walking around and that you can see the bedding area right behind me there's deer laying right inside of that thing this <laughs> yeah. whole entire time because we eventually watch them walk out of there it's right here yes right mm-hmm. inside that edge yep that's why it's so important to find the beds where deer are laying and then look and see what they can see out of the beds from their perspective at this point uh where what do you have in mind? Where are you trying to go? Or I, mean, wh- I don't want to set up on right up against that transition where your cursor is. Yep. I'm not don't want to set up right there because that's just too close. But Brody and I are looking over here just out of frame to the left. There's a couple of pin oaks over there, and we were trying to think, you know, if we could get up underneath one of those trees and then shoot across that slough. We're finding all those tracks. I mean, you can see all the tracks in the slough mm-hmm. right there, um, where the deer are coming out of the bedding and down through that. You know, and that's only about 20 yards from that pin oak. Maybe a blessing in disguise that we're setting up on the ground because we can kind of get a little bit closer to the bedding this way. And we might have been able so to set up in that tree if we had a saddle and we were by ourselves. Buck tracks down there leading in and out of these bedding areas. Mm. We're going to slide down it a little ways and get set up. That's probably right. That's probably as far as we want to go. There's lots of big buck tracks going in and out of there. Where they're coming up the edge and then they're crossing right there. That's the pin oak right there that we set up against. Okay. And Brody and I both crawled in there um, to stay low, but to also mad that grass down so that we had shooting lane out to the slough. Okay, so at this point, you're set up anticipating shooting anything coming out of the bedding right here? Yep, I'm assuming. and down through that slough on those trails that we've been walking around. That tree that we hung in is just right there in the back of the frame, right okay. where that, right where your cursor's at. Okay. Yep, and as you can see, it's the biggest, it's <laughs> like pretty much the only yeah. tree in there. <laughs> right before we came up out of that slough, we heard a deer cough over there. This wind cover is allowing us to get really tight to these deer in their beds. I would assume we're going to see some more tonight. This may actually work because I can hide in this grass. As windy as it is, they shouldn't be able to hear me moving around. And they're walking the edges of this slough. If I let them get just right below me and come to full draw and raise up, I might be able to get a good clean shot at one. Was there any... Was the wind just consistent the whole night? I'm assuming mm-hmm. in that low marshland, there wasn't any swirling to speak of. It was no, just it was very consistent. I think yeah. that's why that we were able to get away with staying on these deer so close. It was out of the west. It was blowing straight up that slough. And Brody's actually standing up while he's filming most of this. With, mm-hmm. Right mm-hmm. up against yeah. the... I mean, we just... that tree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we tucked you right up in that pin oak, and he just had the camera like this. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go. So deer starting to move. Is Yep, you can see these does are coming right out of that bedding area. See her right there? Now you can you can keep playing it oh, if okay. you want. So is that within bow range right there? Yeah, I'm she's assuming. 30 yards. Brody, they didn't have a clue you were standing up in that tree, did they? Nope. 
There's enough branches and see, she and stuff. came. She came right out of there, right by where that and tree we had is about at. Thirty minutes of light left. We just had a doe come right in here to about twenty yards. She didn't even have a clue we were in the world, but she was looking back down the slough. She was so close that I hadn't been able to get up and look. But once she eases off a little bit, I'm going to peek up over that slough. I bet there's more deer down there. Basically, the wind is coming straight from this buck to where we're set up at. Go ahead. Down. Pause that, Greg. This is why we continue to preach how close you guys got to get to bedding. Um, just when it comes to deer hunting in general, I just think a beginner, expert, whoever you are, you're going to have a better chance, especially with a bow at killing deer if you're hunting close to bedding areas. This buck stands up and he probably walks 20 yards from where he's bedded and lays right back down again. Mm -hmm. Didn't move at all. Yeah. Like there and he lays down and now Brody and I are forced to make a decision. Like, <laughs> what do we do here? Are we going to have to go up there and tomahawk him? Or... <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, how far is that deer? 100 yards. 100 yards. And we were and hoping he was going to come right up there where those does did. But when he laid down, we we're like, man, we got 20 minutes of light left, 15 yep. minutes of light mm -hmm. left. We got to make something happen here. Uh, what time of the year? This is October 26th. And how far did you feel comfortable shooting in that wind? Maybe 25 yards. 25, yep. Okay, here we go. We just spotted a real nice buck right down this slough about 100 yards away. I think I'm going to try to fill Brody's stock up there and kill him. He's bedding down right now, and this wind is 30 miles an hour. He'll never even hear him coming. Give me that camera, Brody. You see him? Try to get to that to that tree. If you can get to that tree right there, and then stand up. What's that? You can that tree? Yep. You've got to go. Just watch the hunt here for a second. These aren't cutaways, as you guys could tell here in a minute. You're going to see Brody and the deer in the same frame. He was able to get in that slough and just go straight at that buck while he's bedded. There's the buck. Let me use your cursor, Greg, to show him where he's at. Oh, nope, there it is. There you go. There's a graphic. <laughs> so, Brody, did you feel like you were moving too fast? Or did mm. you feel like... Like, what was your thought process as you're going towards this deer? I mean, you're moving pretty fast there, obviously. Yeah. I'm assuming you're down below in that little yep, down ditch right the, there yep. to where there's there's no way that deer could see you. Yeah, I probably by. moved, I guess hindsight's twenty twenty, but I probably moved too slow. Because like you said, I'm down in that thing. I probably could have zipped with the wind. I probably could have zipped a lot faster down that and popped up a little quicker than I did. But I didn't want <laughs> to go too quick. But yeah, I probably could have went a little bit quicker to get there because you know he couldn't see me or smell yeah. me with the wind blowing where right. it was so did you guys have a point picked out where you knew you needed to be or were you just yeah trying? okay yeah. So there's, there's, a, a, there's a dead tree that you'll see him crawl up next mm -hmm. to here in just a second so you guys had picked that out before you even started moving yeah so a point i knew you needed kind to of where to. i needed to pop right. up and right just be drawn when i popped up over the hill there okay right there Brody obviously right there yep there's that tree deer just stood up there could you see that Brody at that time do you no. remember nope so you couldn't see the deer here and see if we would have got a stand in that tree right there we'd have been in a money spot but it's got so many dead limbs and branches in it that yeah.
Right now the deer is facing right at Brody. The wind is, is not necessarily coming straight from the deer to us right here. I saw Timothy ask the question right there. It looked like the deer was bedded with his nose into the wind. He's actually standing right now with the wind at his back. Now he's not. He's turned. But the wind is blowing straight out of the bedding right at the deer when he's laying there. It's almost northwest instead of straight west coming straight from the deer to us. You're drawing on him right here, mm -hmm. aren't you? I thought about taking the shot, but he was walking just too far, like straight away from me, that I didn't feel comfortable slinging one in there. But he is definitely within bow range there. Mm -hmm. Twenty-five, mm -hmm. maybe, probably. Yeah, man, he's a nice-looking buck, man. Real nice buck. So, are you at full draw still here, Brody, or did? Mm -hmm. I drew when I came. Warp told me to make sure you're drawn when you come, you come up, up over that, so you're just right. ready to go. So I was when I peeked up over there, and then when he got farther away and was walking away, I knew I wasn't going to have a shot. I let down. Here he comes back. <laughs> <laughs> Deer has no idea he's there still. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever see him? Yeah. That close. <laughs> He just was quartering too hard yeah. for you, wasn't he? Yeah. He still had no idea you were there. Not good for That close, though. That was a big deer. Well, I just snuck up there real fast and kind of marked him like Aaron said, so I knew where he was at. Snuck along that bank, just popped up over that hill, and immediately, immediately when I popped up over, I seen him right there. He was just quartering too hard. If he'd have been turned or just standing there, I'd been able to take the shot. He was so close, but just quartering too much. He just kind of walked off back into those wheels again, didn't even know I was there, but that was pretty sweet. Never been that close to that big a buck before, just like that. <laughs> but that wind, you know, that wind just helps you sneak hard along in there. You don't get in here yet. He said he's just too, too much quartering away. He made the right call though. Yeah, I wanted to. It was like close and I was like, right before I left, Warp told me don't take nothing but a good broadside shot and I didn't want to take anything but that. But Man, it was so close. I really wanted to. Looked at him in the binoculars afterwards. Just huge. <laughs> <laughs> Vlad asked a good question a minute ago, bro. Uh, he said that he's pretty new to beast hunting and beast tactics and have followed us for a while. He wants to know, what can you tell a guy like him that's been hunting for three years? to help him get started hunting buck beds and finding them from what your experience has been like uh i guess being exposed to it for the first time this year mm -hmm. i guess the biggest thing for me was just getting out there and just seeing all the different scenarios you yeah. know like just getting out there and finding the beds and then just really thinking about it because i know coming in i was you know i've been hunting but i'd hunt but i wouldn't kind of break down the hunt and really think about like why that buck's bedding there, or why he was moving to food when he was, or different stuff like that. So I guess basically just get out there and experience as much of that as you can. Like getting out there and scouting and just really thinking about those beds when you find them. Yeah, and you brought up a good point there, and it's it's really just, a, it's whenever you see a buck or you see a mature buck, think about why he's there, what he's doing, where he's mm -hmm. coming from, where he's going, and just continue to ask yourself why all the yeah. time. And you're eventually gonna start seeing similarities and trends and finding answers. Yeah, we got a comment from Bryce Lambley on here and he said he hunts a similar property with almost no mature trees available. And actually, I think we had him on last year, mm -hmm. maybe about this time, sometime in summer, talking about uh, his hunting tactics on these uh, kinds of properties. Maybe we can get Bryce back on again for people that uh, you know didn't catch that podcast last year because it was really good. Yeah, and Bryce is, he's talking about killing mature bucks out of trees that are, you know, that you can just barely get up into, you know, and it's fascinating, and I don't think he was even that high up off the ground. He kills a lot of nice bucks with a, with a stick bow, traditional not very, not, not very, very high far. up in small trees sometimes, so maybe we can get Bryce on again, because it's, that's a, um, it's pretty interesting when people are killing deer in, in those kinds of situations where, a lot of hunters would just overlook it as mm -hmm. a potential hunting spot or would overlook hunting out of small trees when you can still you know, get up in there and kill deer in the right conditions. And that 
the conditions you guys had, real breezy 20, 25 mm -hmm. mile an hour winds would be perfect for uh, for hunting in those tough kinds of situations. When but. do you have a buck that refuses to move until dark? Do you work with a group to wind bump? We rarely see that bucks refuse to move until dark. Um, we just, I won't go into a long detail of it, but we don't necessarily believe in uh, nocturnal movement. Most bucks, mature bucks, even the oldest of bucks on the property will get up and do something during daylight. Like you saw in this instance, the buck stood up and he moved 20, 30 yards and he laid back down. Just not very far. Just not moving very far. Mm -hmm. So, and that's why we're constantly talking about just getting inside that bubble, you know, because they're just not going to... in. In most situations, you know, a, a buck will occasionally have that personality where he, he stands up and he walks a long distance, mm -hmm. and you would call that daylight active in many cases mm -hmm. that where you're getting lots of daylight photos of him further away from his bedding area, but that's an anomaly. Like, that's, that's definitely not the norm. Yeah. Most mature bucks, and I'm sure most of you that are watching this, if you look back through your pictures, most of the mature buck photos that you have are probably at night. And that's just because mature bucks don't move very far from the bedding. Someone asked, do you think the buck was there to keep an eye on the does since it was so close to Probably, the yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Definitely is a likely possibility. But we've been seeing bucks bedded throughout that willow thicket for the last the, the couple weeks prior mm -hmm. to that as well. But that was the end of legal. Yes, right. Like Right, right at the close. end of legal on the 26th of October during a cold front. Mm hmm you know, and you, you just have no chance at killing that deer. A lot of people are setting up on the ag or the acorns that are 150 yards from where that buck's bedded. Yep. And that's all it is. As the crow flies, it's not very far. It's 150 yards. But he only moves 20 yards in he's, an hour. Yeah, he's not very far. <laughs> but you can, that just shows you, that hunt shows you how close you can get to these things. As long as you plan correctly for it. We got lucky in this instance and had the wind to help us. Mm. Did you specifically wait until the wind direction changed? Yes, before, before moving in that day. Yeah, yes. we did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We ought to go into some of this aquatic vegetation stuff. Greg's got some real cool footage here of uh, deer browsing in a marsh, kind of like this. It looks like. Yeah, I just trying to come up with segments that we can do every now and then. It's just not anything real hunting tactic related, but just kind of of interest. Oh yeah, you know, it's whitetails are such fascinating animals that. And they, if you observe them enough, you see them eating stuff that maybe you wouldn't think about that they would that would be palatable to them or would be preferable mm -hmm. to them. But one of the things is um, some aquatic vegetation that I've seen deer eat over the years, and one is algae. Algae. Yep. And as you can see, this this is just there's some low lying water, just some mucky water in um, a soybean field, and these deer. We're just eating this algae like crazy. You know, you might look and think that they're maybe just trying to get a drink of the water, but as you can see, this buck is they're just actually eating. It. Yeah, just mowing down on the algae, and then his his muzzle is just you know all covered in it. So, algae is actually very high in protein. Hmm. Very and um, and what's your stuff you got up there? That's yeah. With, what, I mean, spirulina? deer. Yeah, deer obviously. <laughs> <laughs> what's that love stuff? The algae and uh, algae is actually. Very good uh, for humans too. So this I is, wouldn't eat it like that deer was eating it. This but is, this is this is actually you're telling me I need to put moss on my yes, sandwich. Yes, put algae in your sandwich. Well, your smoothie. That's what Mindy and I do. Oh you put yeah, put that in your smoothie. I've but drank it. The smoothies it's, they're good. Oh yeah, it's it's high in protein. I mean it. Yeah, here get you a whiff of that. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Holy cow. Brody, get a sniff. Smells like catfish bait, kind of. <laughs> Doesn't smell good, but it's good for you. It's high in protein. It's high in antioxidants. It's like, you know, helps fight cancer causing agents. It's really, really good stuff. It's expensive. It smells bad, but it's really good for you. So, anyways, algae. It's good deer. for us and it's good for the deer. Yeah, deer. Aquatic love vegetation. Algae. Here's, here's another video of deer. Is he eating algae he's there eating too? He's eating algae. All, yeah, he's eating algae. Yeah. I believe. But also, there's uh, some footage here in just a little bit of a doe. I believe she's just grabbing milfoil you'll see her with a big mouth what's milfoil exactly oh uh, just some kind of similar to algae vegetation okay uh, i don't i don't know that it's similar to algae but there if you can see that she's pulling up milfoil and probably eating the algae too really 
That's interesting. So yeah, that was that was neat to find. I those wonder deer. if when uh, we found a bunch of that's emergent vegetation, and then the stuff that Brody and I found yesterday is duck potato, and I don't remember what the scientific wording of of it is, but it's the same type of stuff, arrowhead, arrowhead plant, plant that we were hunting over last fall except it looked slightly different like if you google arrowhead plant it looks just like an arrowhead and this stuff that we found has more rounded waxy leaves mm -hmm. but it's like i googled it and looked it up it's the same basic family of plant mm -hmm. that grows and and it's not doesn't grow under the water so much as it does in just moist conditions right and, and shallow yeah. water yeah six to twelve inches of water i believe is optimal for duck potato what is that how do you pronounce that sagit oh <laughs> Sagittaria lancifolia. Sagittaria lancifolia. There you go. That's, uh, That's kind of what it looks like. You can see a little bit there, maybe, of what it looks like. Yep, and we found it yesterday. And it wasn't, see right there, it's standing in, you know, a few, a inches, few inches of water. water. Yesterday, when Brody and I found it, it was dry. Mm -hmm. But not super dry. I mean, it was no, still moist. Still, yeah, still in the wet mm -hmm. areas. Yeah. And last year, was it Zach and... Jake maybe or whoever it was saw a deer feeding out in the marshes feeding on that stuff and it looked like a soybean field it was just mm -hmm. it know, was in acres, July acres. when they were yeah about yep. yeah getting close to this time of year and there was just acres and acres of this duck potato plant and the deer were feeding out on, in it like you would see them out in a soybean field mm -hmm. right and then they continued to eat or feed on it throughout the year and then I'm going to switch over here uh, and then this is January of last or this year technically and this is what it looks like after the deer have just, you know, mowed it down over the course of the fall. Right. It was basically just down to the stalks, but this was a feeding pattern. And, you know, anybody that watched uh, the, the series last season probably saw this all play out. But Brody shot his buck in this same marsh, mm -hmm. deer coming out to this uh, duck potato. And then this is... They're just pawing at it like they would a turnip bulb almost. Yep. You know, and that's what... That's all that was left once we got out there was just some stems. Scott said in Maine, milfoil is an invasive species. Yeah, I believe I did see that, that it is invasive. Huh. So here's the duck potato. This is what it. This is what the deer were feeding on in late season, just kind of yeah. the stalks. Those stalks and stems. But the interesting thing is during the late season, everything's just brown and dead. And those stalks and stems were frozen solid. I mean, mm. it was negative 10. But they were still green. Like you could tell there was still a little moisture in them, almost. And that's what those deer were, they were hammering that stuff all year. Mm -hmm. They really liked Spencer it. Spencer asked, like, yeah. how do you keep from getting sweaty and smelly while, while setting up a hanging hunt? You don't. You get sweaty <laughs> and smelly the entire time. By the time we're even at the tree, we're already sweaty and smelly. Yeah. Like we are when we're 300 yards from the car because we're packing so much stuff. We don't worry about scent um, at all. Yeah, there was a there was a question earlier about our scent control regimen, and there really is none. There's I mean, none. you had your your coat tied onto the back of the stands, but you know, we tried to go in with base layers. Or That's something. more so for my own comfort than anything yeah. else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you we know. just we're not big into scent control. We use the wind, and in this instance, you got two sweaty guys out there that are within twenty yards of a couple does, yep. and eventually within. 20 yards of a nice buck and none of those deer even knew we were there they had no idea yep just play that wind right yep hopefully people like the format of breaking down a hunt we're still working out the uh, the kinks with it obviously filming the screen with the camera is not <laughs> <laughs> the best way to it's, go about it's just it. constantly just... a learning experience over yeah. here constantly but so, that's part of the fun so so hopefully people enjoyed it um People that maybe end up watching this later that aren't watching it live, if you have any feedback, leave it as well. If it's something that was, there was a couple comments that people like the the format, so maybe we'll keep doing it and yeah, just keep, more ways to learn and learn and expand on a hunt. Yeah, we got lots of them. Yeah, mm -hmm. so yeah, and hopefully we can get some guests on too and and do some more type stuff. <laughs> That's gonna do it for today, guys. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us. We gotta go. We'll see you.